And good morning again. Glad to have you join us today. If you got your Bibles, why don't you open them up to Genesis chapter 4. And in case you didn't know, if you're newer to the church, if you're just visiting for the first time, uh, we're only uh, a few weeks into a series on the book of Genesis. We're going to teach through every verse in the book of Genesis, including next week, Genesis 5, which is a genealogy. And so I know what some of you are saying is like, oh, I see, you put the church lunch on the day you're teaching the genealogy. I, I see what's going on. Uh, we believe that all scripture is profitable and inspired by God and useful for all types of good reasons, including even the genealogies. And so we're going to go verse by verse, word for word, through the book of Genesis. And if you want to catch up and if you haven't been a part of all that, then hit up our website, thechapelcleveland.com. We've got all of our sermons uh, archived on there so you can be going through the book of Genesis with us because there's so much water that's already under the bridge that we're building on as we're going through the book of Genesis besides the fact that the first three chapters contain so much doctrine that are really the basis of our entire faith um, that, that everything else is built on. So if you want to check that out, uh, you've got access to it and you can catch up there at any point in time. So why don't we pray together and let's open up the Word. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open up your Word, and I thank you for preserving it for us for generations. And Father, uh, as we have, well, for about eight weeks now, uh, we just confess that your Holy Spirit inspired your Word. Your Holy Spirit is the actual author of it, even though you wrote it through maybe 40 different men in so many different places at so many different times. And Father, your Holy Spirit who authored your word, is still our teacher today. Without the help of your Holy Spirit, we can't understand what it has to say. Without the help of your Holy Spirit, we can't put it into practice. We can't do what it says. We can't build our lives around it. We can't orchestrate our hearts towards you. So we're dependent on you in this place. We're confessing that, that that opening up your word is not an act of man. It's not an act of a service. It's not an act of organized religion or an organized church body or whatever the case may be. But this is your business, and we're asking you to have access to the deep places of our hearts so that we can grow in a true knowledge, an experiential knowledge of who you are that causes us to be conformed more and more into your image. And we pray that you would do that in some small way in each of us as we have need as individuals today through what your word says in Genesis chapter 4. We thank you, Father. We pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. So I don't know about you guys, but uh, I had an experience that I'll relate to you, and I'll see if you can relate to it, maybe in your own life. So uh, lately, life has been a little bit busy for us as a family. i got a family of six, and we've got a lot of moving parts in our lives right now. They're all good things, but nevertheless, it's still busy. So yesterday, I'm going to church, Calvary Chapel, downtown in Chattanooga. I'm still there on Saturdays. And I got to pick up a quick lunch, hadn't had time to do that, got a shower, got out of the house, hit the drive through at Wendy's, and I pull up to the drive through and there's no answer. Nobody comes on the intercom and says, hello, sir, thank you for venturing to our establishment today and bringing your wallet with you. How can I serve you food? Like nothing comes out of the machine. And so I'm just sitting there. And so I sit there for a little while. And to be frank, I didn't actually get agitated. So I was actually, that this will tell you how immature I am, I was actually proud of myself for not getting agitated <laughs> that nobody w- greeted me like that quickly. And I was like, yeah, man, I am a saint. <laughs> and so nobody comes on the intercom, and I realize that nothing's going to happen. And so I pull up to the window, and I pull up to the window, and for a little while, I can't even see anybody up front, like not at a register, not fixing some drinks, not at the window, not taking orders, not anything. I can't see anybody, but I can hear some folks laughing. I hear laughter, but I don't see anybody helping anybody. So I just wait, and I finally see somebody, and they kind of walk by, and they don't acknowledge me, and they kind of walk back by, and I hear some more talking, I hear some more laughing, and hey, listen to this. I'm still checking my sainthood here. I'm still not mad. I'm still not agitated, right? Wow is right, right? And so, and so I just kind of wait patiently. I'm thinking there's just some kind of mistake here. Some technology's broken down. No big deal, whatever. I have all this consideration. And finally, somebody sees me, and they look at me kind of like, like, what are you doing at the window? You're supposed to order from back there. And I'm like... <laughs> and they come to the window, and they open up the window, and they're like, can I help you? 
And I said, yeah, I, I pulled up to the drive-thru, but nobody answered, so I just came up here, and I just need to place an order. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry, the thing didn't, it didn't click. And I said, yeah, I know, but there's somebody back there even now, so if it didn't click, something's not working right, because somebody else is waiting. So she takes my order, okay, two double stacks off the menu. Y'all like the double stack? All right, pretty cheap little burger, right? So I ordered my two double stacks, and I will say that even though I wasn't aggravated, I did have the fleeting thought that maybe they'll hit me up with a little frosty action here and won't charge me anything, right? Because I waited for a while, and I'm thinking maybe some free food is in order here. But I don't ask for it. I don't say anything. I don't pitch a fit. I don't cop any attitude. I don't do any of that because I'm a pastor, and I don't do those types of things. So I get my food. Five, that'll be $5. Give her my credit card, they charge it, I pull out. When I'm pulling out to turn right on the East Brainerd Road, I look at the sign, and I just paid for two double stacks, $5, and on the sign it says, for a limited time, four double stacks for $4. Brother just lost his sainthood right there. I was fine. I was fine. Don't wait on me all day. It's an honest mistake, whatever the case may be. When I see the sign, now all of a sudden in my heart, I'm saying, oh, you ain't even got the consideration to tell brother that it's four for four dollars. I paid you five dollars for two of those things and waited because you messed your job. Are you serious? Like that's what was going on in my heart. I actually said it out loud. In my car with nobody around, I'm going through this out loud. Are you serious? In my car. That is our sense of justice. That's what it is. It's our sense of justice. When anything happens to us that we perceive to slight us, our sense of justice kicks in and we get this anger and we get this sense of retribution and we get all these types of things that well up in us and most of the time they are not holy. Y'all, I was ready to raise some cane. I was thinking at that time, I need to call the store. I need to go online. If I had a Twitter account, I could complain publicly. I would tweet it and see how many retweets I can get. I know they, they, you know, Wendy's gave some dude lifetime of nuggets for so many million retweets. Maybe I can get something going here. I'm having all these kinds. I was ready to raise, raise cane. Now, I want you to think about that. That sense of justice is something we're going to be confronted with in the context of our personal sin and how God deals with us in the context of our sin. And you're going to see it today in the story of Cain and Abel, specifically in how Cain dealt with God in the context of his own personal sin. And that sense of justice that we all have is hovering there over that entire story. And you're going to feel it as we walk through this story and God's going to ask you to humble yourself in the face of your sin through what you see happen in the life of Cain. So if you're taking notes this morning, the title of the message is Raising Cain, Genesis chapter 4. It makes sense, right? It makes sense. Raising Cain. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now the man, who is the man that we're speaking of for those who have not been present with us? That's Adam. Now the man had relations, or your version may say he knew his wife. Talking about the sexual relationship. He had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Now I want you to think about something real quick. You may not make this connection, but back in Genesis 3, we saw the first clear prophecy of the coming of Jesus Christ in Genesis 3.15. So in the midst of the curse, we have this proclamation that there's going to be a Messiah and the Messiah is going to crush the head of the enemy. So here we have this very fresh prophecy, and I can't tell you exactly how much time has passed. It does not tell us in the Scripture. But we have this prophecy given by God to Eve that she will bear the seed that will destroy the enemy by crushing his head. And now she has a child, by the way. We don't have record of any children being born at this point in time, okay? We don't have any other record. What do you think Eve was thinking the first time she had a baby? There were no, like, you know, Bradley method classes at that point in time. You understand? There was no Lamaze. There was no anything else. It was the first one. How real do you think the curse was to Eve when she had that first child? Pain in childbirth? Oh, I get it. I am so sorry. 
I am so sorry. Can we do something about this? She has that child, but also think about this. She also has the promise of this prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. Do you think it was possible that she thought that Cain was the Messiah? What do you think? I'm not preaching that, it, that that is what she's thinking. I'm asking you a question. Do you think it's possible that she thought that he was the Messiah? I think it's very possible. I think it's very possible. Now, right now, I'm hearing David Bowie. Dun, 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 under pressure, right? <laughs> think about Cain. What if you grow up and the thought is in your household that you are potentially the Messiah, the one who's going to save humanity from the punishment that they've fallen under because of sin. Can you feel a little bit of pressure in that regard? Now, I'm not saying that's the way Cain grew up. I'm just wondering. I'm wondering if that's the expectation his parents had for him. I'm wondering if that's the expectation he even had for himself in this context of this story that we're about to see. And I can't answer those questions, but it makes you wonder. It makes you provoked. It makes you think. And that's how you guys need to read Scripture. That's what's going to cause it to come to life. That's what's going to cause it to pop. That's what's going to cause you to engage with it. Verse 2, again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground... Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. Let me ask you another question. Had the sacrificial system even been set up at this point in time in history? No. That happens in Leviticus. If you want to read it, you can write it down. Go look at Leviticus 2, Leviticus 3. You can even read Leviticus 17 to to talk about the, the importance of the fat that was brought with the animal sacrifices. It was said when it burned to be a sweet aroma before the Lord. It was extravagant. It was luxurious. It was wealthy. It was something that was a blessing before God to bring that as a sacrifice. But point being, God had already cultivated in the hearts of men this idea that there was sacrifice that was brought to God in the worship of God. And we even saw that reflected in the fact that first Adam and Eve cover themselves with leaves. They make for themselves loin coverings. And then God makes a sacrifice and covers them with skins back in Genesis chapter 3. And we see that sacrifices are still a part of the picture. But look at what happens. Abel brings the sacrifice from his firstlings of his flock, and God regards it. He gives it respect. He receives the offering, and in a sense, he also receives Abel who brought the offering. But Cain brings an offering too. Now, is there anything in the Scripture to infer that an offering from the earth of produce was less than an offering from the herd or some type of animal? Is there anything there to infer that? No, there's not, okay? If we go read about the sacrificial system, can they serve different purposes? Yes, they can. But what we are told is this. In a very simple manner, the sacrifice that Cain brought, God did not regard it, and he did not regard him. And those are two slightly different things. But in Abel's case, the sacrifice that he brought, God both regarded him, and he also regarded the sacrifice. Verse 5, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Now I want you to keep in mind his reaction, but I also want you to understand that you would be completely justified to ask a question here. What is the question you should be asking at this point in time in the scripture? Why? Why would God regard the sacrifice of one man and not regard the sacrifice of another man? Now, how many of y'all have read this story before and your first thought was that this was unfair? Thank you for being honest. Because I did too. The first time I ever remember reading this story, my first thought was, well, that's not fair. They both brought a sacrifice to God. Why would God respect one sacrifice in one man and not respect the other sacrifice and not respect the man? Well, Scripture does clarify for us. This is Hebrews 11, verse 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. 
I can't tell you the exact mechanism, the exact reason why one sacrifice was regarded and one man was regarded and one wasn't. But what we are told in Scripture is by faith, Abel made a better sacrifice than Cain did. We know that for a fact. The other things are inference. But I want you to think about something for a second. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 25 through 30, in my translation, and I'm not going to read all the scripture to you right now for the sake of time. You can look it up. Ezekiel 18, 25 through 30. God is challenging the people of Israel, and he basically says something to them like this. Do you not think that my ways and my judgments are right? Another translation of right is equal. He says, you don't think my judgments are right. You don't think they're equal. Are not my ways right? Are not they equal and your ways are not right and your ways are not equal? So here's the question. Think about something for a second. Is God always fair in the way that we think fairness should work? Nope, he's not. Listen, let me, let me give you all a little piece of like counsel, okay? Please receive this from me. Please receive this from me because it could save you a lot of grief for a lot of years. God does not work by the fairness doctrines of man. He does not give to everyone equally. He does not regard everyone exactly the same way. He does not. It's just a fact of life in our world. And it's not contradicted in Scripture in any way, shape, form, or fashion that every person receives the same lot in life. That is not the way it works, spiritually speaking. Now, do you have access to many of the same blessings, spiritual blessings, through the covenants that God has given us? Yes. But there are so many other things in life that we shake our fist at God and we say, it's not fair that, that I didn't get this and they did. It's not fair that I did get this and they don't, so therefore I can't enjoy the things that God's given me. It's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. And God looks back and he says, oh, so I'm not right? Oh, I'm not fair. No, you, you need to check yourself. You need to look in the mirror. You might want to rethink that. You're not right. You're not equal. My ways are right. My ways are equal. He's not fair in the sense that we expect fairness. And honestly, that's fine. 1 Samuel 2, 3 says he weighs our actions. In Proverbs 16, 2, it says he not only weighs our actions, but he weighs our motives. Do you think it's possible that Cain brought an offering, but his ways and his motives and his heart were not in line with the outward action? Is that possible? Yeah. And we know in Scripture that Abel brought a better sacrifice through faith. I think I'm inferring through these things. I believe that Cain did not come in faith. I believe he made a religious offering. He was sitting in the church pew. He threw some money in the box. He fulfilled an outward duty, an outward religious expression, but his heart was really not submitted before God. And God is the one who weighs. He's the one who determines what's right. He's the one who determines the balance. He's the one who determines fairness and equality. He's the one who determines if the heart is in the right place. He's the one who decides right and wrong. And he didn't regard Cain's offering as one that was worthy. And he couldn't show him regard because of that. Now look at verse 6. I want you to understand there's mercy in this passage, just like there was mercy in the fall that we saw last week. There was mercy all over it. Now, Cain, his sacrifice was not regarded by God. Was it God's fault? No. He doesn't come by faith when he brings his sacrifice. Okay? Now, would God be justified, as with any of us, I'm going to use an Old Testament word, would God be justified to just smite him right there? Absolutely. By the way, how do you think that he knew that his sacrifice was not regarded? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. You know, I really don't know. Again, I, I'm just thinking through the scripture and asking questions. I'm not telling you the way it was. But there's examples in many Old Testament passages that when people brought an offering before God, how did they know it was received? Like fire fell out of heaven and consumed the offering. What if you go to the family worship service and Abel walks up and brings his fatling and puts it up there and fire from heaven comes down and blows the thing up. And then you bring your sacrifice from the, from the ground and you set it there and it's like, all right, God, like drop the bomb on it. 
All right, can, you know, let's try one more time. Can you, can, you do, can you do a little something? Would that be a little bit awkward? A little bit awkward? I don't know. Was it something in his heart? Was it something that God said? All right? Was it something, was it an outward sign that one was regarded and one was not? I don't know. But Cain knew it. It looks like other people knew it. It was knew that his sacrifice was not regarded and that he himself was not regarded. But watch the fact that God does not abandon him, but offers mercy to him. Look at verse 6. Then the Lord God said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Now, did Cain have a problem with his offering? Yes. Did God choose to just smite him and cast him out right there because he had a problem? No. He, he, he tells him, he warns him. Y'all, I want y'all to understand, verse 6 and 7 right there, that's the moment of truth. That's the moment of truth where Cain has an opportunity to take the way out so that he does not fall into sin. And God takes the time and demonstrates the care to a man whose heart was not completely yielded to him in faith to say, all right, be careful. I'm warning you because I'm your heavenly father and because I love you and because I've got compassion for you and because I know what's right and wrong and because I want you to do the right thing because your best is to seek after me. Cain, I want you to understand right now your heart's in a bad place. Sin is crouching at the door and its desire is to master you. Its desire is to devour you. Its desire is to take you in a place that you don't even understand you could go right now even though your heart hasn't been offered to me in faith. It's its desire is to conquer you, is to kill you, but you must master it. That's the moment of truth. Now, let me ask you guys a question as Christians. Right now, I'm speaking to those who have put their faith in Christ. I'm not speaking to a person in the room right now who hasn't sought to follow after Jesus. I'm speaking specifically to Christians. Do y'all recognize that moment in your sin struggles? Do y'all recognize that? I do. Let me tell you something, okay? We will sin. We will struggle. We will fall. First John 2, 1 through, you know, through 2, 1, basically the, the idea being is when we sin, we have an advocate with Christ Jesus the righteous. But here's the thing. When you take it down to a micro level, and when you look at each individual decision and each individual time you are tempted, do you have a way out every time? You do. Every single time, not because you're something special, not because you're powerful, not because you're great, not because you're righteous, but because you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. First Corinthians 10, 13, for every temptation, for every single one, God has given you a way out so that you may be able to endure it. And right now, God is defining that for Cain. He's saying, I'm giving you a way out. I'm giving you an option. Just choose this. And that's what he's saying to every one of us. I'll tell you one thing I know about myself. Two things. Number one is that I believe the curse in Genesis 3, and that I believe apart from God, there is nothing in me. Apart from God, I'm sick, I'm nasty, I'm perverted, I'm gross, I'm lost, I'm very dark. I'm very dark, apart from the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the other thing I know is this, that every single time I come to a place of temptation, I have a choice. So you know what it means? Not only do I have a choice of the way out, it means that every single time I sin in my Christian life, it's because I chose sin. You understand what I'm saying? It's because I chose sin. I chose sin and to allow it to master me rather than to master it and submit myself to God. That's what I'm talking about. Now, are some things harder than others? Are some things kind of snap judgments and things happen fast and things like that? Sure they are. Sure. Some things are a little bit different. They well up in different ways. The circumstances bring them about in different ways. But right now, this is the moment of truth. I want you to recognize it in your own life so that you can capitalize in that moment and choose what is right and humble yourself before God and not allow your pride to do what it's about to do to Cain. Verse 8, God has shown him the mercy to offer him a way out. And in verse 8, it says that Cain told Abel, his brother... Now, I want you all to remember something about this. The, the, typically, the church, and our church says this too, if you don't know what we believe as a church, you can go to our website and look at our statement of faith. 
And one of the things that it's going to say is that we believe that the Scriptures are inerrant in their original writings. So what does that mean? It means that this is not an original writing. Now let me tell you guys something. Historically speaking, what you have in your hands is a very, very, very accurate translation of Scripture. Very. Okay? I mean, it far surpasses the tests of any other historical document that you want to compare it to, and it's not even close. I don't care what they tell you in a, a, a secular academic environment or even in a seminary that promotes biblical criticism, a Christian seminary. This, as a historical document, stands up far beyond any other historical document you have or will ever read. Yet, we say that it was, a, it was un, inerrant in the original writings. This is a case in point in this verse. Did you read that verse? Or at least the first part of it? Did it read a little strange? Look at it again. Chapter 4, verse 8. God told Abel, his brother. What are you thinking right now? Told him what? Like, are you missing a little something? And it says, And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. All right, Richie, what kind of point are you trying to drive home? This is a place where commentators think there are a couple of words missing from the original manuscripts to what we have now. And what we believe was happening here is that Cain lured his brother Abel out into the field. He told him, hey, why don't you come out in the field and let's hang out a little bit. I got some cornhole boards. Why don't you come out here and let's throw a little bit, all right? You got the beanbags? Come on out on the field with me for a minute. Let's have a little bro time, okay? That's the basic idea that we believe is happening there because there are a few words that may be lost in the translation. All right, that's the point. And I think it's important that you know that when you talk about biblical criticism. So they're in the field, and Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now keep in mind that God has already warned him that sin wants to master him, but then he says, you must rule over it. You must master it. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? Did God actually need an answer to that question? So why do you think he's asking? Why why do you think? What is he affording Cain the opportunity to do? Dude, come clean. Like confess, repent. Like bring your heart and like dump out all your junk. Like bring bring it to me. I know. I already know the answer. I already know how you feel. I already know the condition of your heart. But why don't you take a step towards me? He's opening up a door for grace. He's opening up a door for mercy just by asking the question. Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. I am my brother's. Am I my brother's keeper? Famous line. Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. All right, now listen to this. I want you to take note. This is the punishment that God enacts on Cain for his sin and for his refusal to repent for his sin. And I want you to listen to it carefully because you're going to see some contradictions just a couple of verses later. Verse 12. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Now let me tell you what I see here. What I see is an absolute proclamation of a consequence for sin and a lack of repentance. And that consequence is a magnification of the curse. Because what had God already told Adam in the context of the curse? Hey, work was good before, but now what's the ground going to grow from you that you've never cultivated before? Thorns and thistles. And then he looks at Cain, whose profession, by the way, was what? What did Cain do for a living? He was a tiller of the ground. He was in agriculture, okay? And he looks at the tiller of the ground, and he says, when you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. That's an absolute proclamation of a magnification of the curse on Cain's life as a punishment for his sin. And remember, he's still not walking in righteousness here. He still has not confessed. He has not repented. He has not brought his sin before God and asked for forgiveness in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Now look at the second part of verse 12. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Now, I actually have questions about that one. The second part of the verse, I'm not sure if it's a proclamation or if it's a prophecy of what Cain's going to choose. I'm not sure which one it is. 
I'm not actually sure that it's a punishment that God enacted on Cain. I almost wonder if he knew that Cain was going to choose that. Look at what Cain answers in verse 13. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. What's still missing? What's still missing? Repentance. I'm sorry. I did something wrong. I agree that I've, you know, that I've transgressed your word. None of that has happened. My punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Now, did God, just, did God say all the stuff that Cain just said? No. No, he didn't say that. All right, now what's the point here? Because y'all need to think about this. That's Cain's interpretation of how God would respond to his sin. Now, do you ever have a different interpretation for what God's going to do because of your sin that God actually does? Yeah. God has spoken his word to Cain. And as far as I can tell, the only thing that he tells him is an absolute punishment for his sin is it's going to be even harder for you to grow anything than it ever has been already as a punishment for your sin. And then Cain takes that and he jumps to these conclusions. You've driven me on this day from the face of the ground. You, and from your face I will be hidden. Did God ever say he was going to hide his face from him? Nope, not one time. You won't find it. And I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. Did God pronounce a death sentence on him? Nope, not other than the one he chose through the curse and through sin. These are things that Cain believes to be true. Now, this happens to be, you're going to hear me. If you're here for a long time, you'll hear me talk about this idea. It is human nature to live on a pendulum. We tend to swing one way, all the way over to one side, or because we don't like something that seems extreme to us, we like to swing all the way over to the other side where it's extreme over here, and we have a really hard time finding moderation in the middle. You know what I'm saying? Look at Cain's reaction to his sin. What is his reaction when his sin is not regarded? What happens to him? He gets ticked. He is angry. He's angry at people. He's angry at God. He's angry at people because he's angry at God. Why does he lash out and kill Abel, his brother? Well, it's real simple. It's because your vertical relationship with God will determine the state of your horizontal relationships with other people. So because he's angry about this relationship, now he's angry about all these relationships, and he's going to find a way to take his anger out. So he reacts to his sin in a spirit of anger, and now when he sees the consequences of his sin, he comes from anger all the way over here to absolute, utter despair despondency, shame, I can't be accepted, I'll never have a relationship with you, I'll never be forgiven for these things, I'll never have any opportunity, there is no life for me, there is no future, there is no forgiveness, there is no good, there is only my sin for the rest of my life, and there is no hope and no future. He starts with anger, and the pendulum swings all the way over to absolute despondency. There's a quote from Donald Barhouse. Listen to this. One of the consequences of sin is that it makes the sinner pity himself instead of causing him to turn to God. One of the first signs of new life is that the individual takes sides with God against himself. Cain never did that. He never took sides with God against himself. He took sides with himself Angry because God did not regard him. And then despondent and lost in depression because he feels like God can't accept him. Not because of what God said, because of what he concludes. Verse 15, so the Lord said to him, Whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no, no one finding him would slay him. So even in the midst of his sin, even in the midst of his lack of repentance, what does God still show Cain? Mercy. Still shows him mercy. He still shows him mercy. Y'all, you, you got to find this. You have to understand the character of who God is and how he responds to people. 
As long as there's breath in you, there is opportunity for mercy and for grace and for redemption. Amen? And there was opportunity for Cain. He was choosing to run away from the grace and from the, 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 the face of God. Look at verse 16. Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Verse 17, Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch after the name of his son. By the way, I, w- I want to help you guys not be confused. Is this the same Enoch who was taken to heaven, you know, who never died? It's, this is a different one, okay? I want you to understand, you're about to see some names of different characters in Scripture that are repeated, and they're not always the same person, Okay? So make sure you pay attention to the lineage because everything you're reading in chapter 4 is the lineage of Cain. In chapter 5, you're going to read about the lineage of Seth, okay? And you're going to see some of the same names repeated or some of the names that are so close that you're going to be tempted to think they're the same person, and they're not. So you have to be careful to pay attention to the genealogies, and those teach us even more about the importance of our families and what we pass down and discipleship and you know things of that nature. So this is not the same Enoch who was taken to heaven by God without ever dying. Also, there's more stuff in here. Is this a complete account of life on earth? Are you all afraid to answer? It's not. It's not. Is every living person named for you right here? They're not, okay? By the way, I'm really going to like mess with y'all right now. Who was Cain probably married to? Probably. (laughs) Yeah, he's probably married to his sister. All right. When uh, When did that become wrong? When did it become wrong? (laughs) That's true. From a scientific standpoint, at this point in time, the gene pool is not polluted, okay? If you were to talk about incestuous relationships right now, y'all remember back to the creation sermon that we had weeks and weeks and weeks ago, okay? Is life advancing and becoming uh, better or is it degrading? It's degrading, okay? So now, the longer we go, the more th- these errors that we have, the more these copying errors, the more, the more uh, mutations that we have, and things like that. And so at this point in time, thousands of generations past this, you get family members together, you're going to end up with some problems. Because those bad things start to match up, and then you have children that have issues because of that. At this point in time, you haven't had those thousands of years of degradation. The population of the earth is very, very small. You're like, dude, are you trying to talk me into believing this is cool? No. I'm just saying, when did it become wrong? Well, when there were other options, but specifically when God said it was wrong. That's when it became wrong. When God identifies something as wrong, that's when it's wrong. All right? Now, I'm going to give you another example of this principle in just a minute as a contrast, and you're going to see what I'm saying. But dude probably was shacking up with his sister. Verse 18, now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehuhel. I have no idea how to say these names. <laughs> I just think it's funny. And Mehuhel became the father of Methushael, and Methushael became the father of Lamech. All right, that's another name you're going to see repeated in chapter 5. They're not the same dude. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. All right, now I want you to take note of something, just because I thought it was funny. Ada, her name meant pleasure and beauty. That's what her name meant, okay? Uh, Zilla, her name meant shade. <laughs> the commentator said it's probably because she had dark hair. I said, like, bro, you missed that one bad, man. If he's got two wives and the first one's named pleasure and beauty, there's a reason the second one's called shade, and it's because of her hair. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Ada gave birth to Jabal. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of those who played the lyre and the pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the forger of implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. This guy sounds like a, I mean, top notch dude, okay? <laughs> 
Give heed to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Sounds like a nice guy, right? Now, let me ask you something. A minute ago, I said, hey, Cain married his sister. Not a real big deal, okay? What did old Lamech do? He had two wives. As far as we know, he was the first poly- polygamist, okay? Would you venture to say that, biblically speaking, that was right or wrong? Y'all are afraid to answer again. You're like, well, God hadn't said in the law. Well, did he not design marriage earlier than this in Scripture? Yeah, he did it back before the fall. All right, one man, one woman. Like, there you go. There's the picture. There's the design. Okay, I need you to understand. Look at this dude's heart. He's bragging about killing folks because of what they did to him. He's using the word murder. It's the same word that was used when Cain slew Abel. He's bragging about this to his two wives. This is not a good dude. And this is not a good sign for Cain. I'm going to tell you all the truth. When I read through this passage, this is the first time I've ever preached this passage. I've preached through the first three chapters in different settings. I've never preached Genesis chapter 4. And when I was reading through this chapter, I was looking for redemption in Cain's life. I was looking for it. Did I find any redemption? Nope. Didn't find it in his reaction before God. Didn't find it in his family. Didn't find it in his lineage. And by the way, as far as we know, this is it for for Cain's family. We have no other record that Cain's family went past this point. Okay? Yeah, there were probably some people and they were probably in a city, but we have nothing else of note to know about Cain's family. It doesn't look like things went well from here. It doesn't look like there was any sign of repentance from him as a man at any point in time in his life, at least none that we know. Verse 25. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. I do not think that that is a coincidence that you see Seth born, and then we have this line that God chose to put in Scripture that then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Seth, without getting into it much, that's the line that we come from. That's the line that the seed came from. All right, now let's talk about some points of application. Points of application from this idea of raising Cain. The first one is this. This is more of a doctrinal thing than it is even specifically about the story of Cain. But it's something we've been dancing around for a while, and I felt like we need to at least talk about it for a second. Get comfortable in this tension. The sovereignty of God and the free will of man. The sovereignty of God and the free will of man. I feel like, not not that we've been trying to avoid it, it's just that I've already been preaching so stinking long, like there's no, there's no time to, I've been, you know, I told y'all before, I apologize, I want to teach the whole Bible on these passages because they touch everything in the Bible. It's really, really difficult. It's been really, really tough. But this idea of free will versus reformed theology, I've just been feeling the tension between it all the way through here. Let me tell you guys where we're coming from, and I'm, I'm going to qualify this by saying this. If you believe differently from us, this is not a place that should cause division in the church. I don't understand all the division that this causes between people and why it gets argued as much as it does. That's my honest feeling about this, all right? but I'll tell you where we're coming from, okay? There are a couple different camps here. One is Calvinism, okay? Named after a guy named what? What was his name? John Calvin, okay? And then there's Armenianism, okay? Armenianism was named after a guy named Jacob Arminius, okay? Now, the first thing I want you to take into account is Calvinism and Armenianism. What are they named after? They're named after men. They're named after men, okay? I think there's a little bit of a hint there. Where I find myself, biblically speaking, and where we find ourselves as a church, is we would just say this. They're both true. Like, did God elect? And did God, you know, did He predestine? And did God, did He choose before the foundations of the earth? Well, yeah, He did. Why do you say that? Because Scripture says so. Okay. Well, do men have free will? Do they have the ability to choose? Did, did God die for all? I believe so. Why do you believe that? Because that's what Scripture says. Does he desire all to come to repentance? Yeah, why? Well, because that's what the Scripture says. 
Okay, So I find myself in a place of not being in a box or not being in a system of doctrinal belief, simply saying that I think I see agreement on both of these issues from Scripture. But what we do is we, when we get on one side or the other, a lot of times we say to the others, hey, you, you can't straddle the line. You can't believe both to be true. Either one is true and the other's not. They're neither, whatever. You can't straddle. You've got to pick one of these positions. And I would simply say I see elements of both in Scripture. And if God's ways truly are higher than our ways, then I believe they can both be true, even if my little pea brain doesn't understand how they can both be true. I just believe He's bigger than that. I don't believe we can put Him in a box. And that's just the way that I see it. But you know what? I I do see choice. Again, I see the predestination. I see the election. I see those things. I also see passages like Colossians 3. Listen to this. Therefore, if you've been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Verse 2, set your mind on the things above. Verse 5, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which amounts to idolatry. Verse 8, but now you also put them all aside, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech from your mouth. And then it goes on and on. These are all imperative commands. And I know from one side of the system, you would say, well, that's speaking to believers that you do these things. Absolutely. But I would even point back to stories like we're seeing here in Genesis chapter 4. Did even Cain appear to have the option to choose to seek after God? That's what it looks like. It looks like God afforded him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Besides the fact that you can go to books like 1 Peter and see that he desires that all come to a saving knowledge. His desires for all to be saved. His desires for all. It's for the whole world. I think you see choice. And I also think you see the sovereignty of God. Even when men made bad choices, did it somehow interrupt or throw off God's plan? No. He was never surprised. He was never without options. He was never like, oh man, I just made a mistake. I missed that one so bad. No. Always prepared. Always has a plan. It never throws him off that axis. It never throws him off of the throne. And I believe it's because of the the crossover between these two ideas. Here's your second point of application. There are two manifestations of pride. Arrogance and insecurity. Two manifestations of pride, arrogance, and insecurity. I want to read you a passage of Scripture real quick. And we've kind of danced around this actually just a little bit. It's 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 through 8. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 8. Start in verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Okay? Now think about this for just a second. In verse 7, it says, casting your anxiety on him. But what's the context that it sets back forward in verse 6? Humble yourselves. Okay? What, What are you talking about? All right, here's the point. In our society, most of the time, how do we think about pride? We think about anger and outright arrogance. But I need you to understand that's only one manifestation of pride. Another manifestation of pride is anxiety, is doubt, of shame and fear and these types of things. We're told in that scripture in the context of pride to humble ourselves, casting our anxieties upon Him. Why do you say that's pride? Because the root of anxiety is trying to wrap our hands around the circumstances of life and squeeze our hands shut and trying to control how things happen. We're trying to play God. And anxiety comes about as a result of it. And then you go to Philippians chapter 4, and it says, that, Hey, when you are anxious, make your needs known in prayer and supplication before God, and He'll give you the peace of Christ which surpasses all comprehension. All understanding. Why? Because you're taking your anxiety away. You're taking your hands off of those circumstances when you simply humble yourselves before God. So here's the deal. Are you angry and are you arrogant about your sin and when you're confronted with those things? I need you to understand that's pride. But I also need you to understand that if you've been in sin 
and you are walking in a continual state of depression before God and just a lack of being able to accept His forgiveness and His mercy and His grace and a continual state of despondency before Him, even though He has offered the sacrifice of the Son of God, that is also pride. And you need to humble yourself before Him. And you need to take the words of probably Paul from Hebrews and you need to come to the throne of grace with confidence. Humble yourselves. To allow Him to root out the pride and then bring it to Him. Here's your third one. Intimacy with God determines intimacy with others. Intimacy with God determines intimacy with others. Okay, We saw that in the life of Cain. That when his relationship with God, at least in his eyes, when it went south and when he was angry at God because God did not respond to his sacrifice and did not show him regard, he responds in anger. Okay, And then he responds in anger to those around him, namely his brother, when he kills him. Ephesians 5.18, it starts off by saying, be filled with the Spirit. Okay, But listen to the result of that. After we're told in Ephesians 5 to be filled with the Spirit, then it goes on to say, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. How many of y'all actually do that? You're like, dude, that would be weird. Okay, That'd be strange. Speaking to each other well. Speaking to each other in a godly manner. Speaking to each other grace and mercy and things that are life-giving. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns. Then it goes on to say, always giving thanks submitting to one another. That's all of us in the church submitting to one another. Then it goes into the roles between husbands and wives. Wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. What's the point? The beginning of all of those relationships in every manner that God has orchestrated them for, for them to work, it begins with being filled with the Spirit. So the test here is this. If your relationships with other people are constantly stressed, constantly struggling, constantly filled with contention, what do you have to look at? you got to look at the vertical relationship. You have to look at your intimacy with your Heavenly Father. You're fighting with your wife all the time. You're fighting with your husband. You're fighting with your brother and sister. You're fighting with all these people. You have to start out by looking at your own heart and the position of your relationship with God, because you have to know that is connected to your relationships with all other people in your life. Your interpersonal relationships are connected with your intimacy with God. Here's the next one. Sin is a submission issue. Sin is a submission issue. Now, y'all, y'all probably already, even some of y'all who are new, at least to me, already know I have a problem that movie quotes and song lyrics and things like this, they just stick with me. And I apologize because names always don't. So some of you are like, why can you remember every quote from every movie, but you can't even remember my name? I'm just being honest with you. It's, I don't know what it is. Like, I have a problem. You can ask my wife. She'll tell you. Okay? But when I'm reading Genesis 4, and, I, I'm, and I'm watching Cain... And I'm, I'm seeing that verse about sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. I'm hearing Bob Dylan. Some of you are like, what? I'm, he- I'm hearing Bob Dylan. Well, 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 it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You're like, that's Bob Dylan? Yeah, he had a Christian like face. You know, it was a while back. You can go look it up. There's some pretty interesting songs from that phase. Well, it can be the devil, or it may be the Lord, but you're going to save some. You're going to serve somebody. Is that true or not, Amen. dude? That is truth. That is absolute, honest to goodness, like rock solid truth right there. And sin, when it comes down to it, sin is really a submission issue. And I want you to be confronted with that when you're in that moment of truth. When God comes to you like He did Cain. And he says, hey, sin is crouching at the door. This is your moment of truth. Which way are you going to go? I want you to understand that is your moment where you're being faced with a submission issue. Am I going to submit to the enemy? Or am I going to submit to the Lord and humble myself and do what is right? Man, let that save you from so much sin and from so many consequences and from so much destruction. Just that thought of submitting to the right master every time the opportunity presents itself, and then when you fail, 
Don't be caught in that despondency. Don't be caught in that shame. Don't be caught in that guilt for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year. Go to the throne of grace of confidence and repent. Here's your last one. Even the sin of man shows the faithfulness of God. I mentioned a little bit earlier this idea that God desires all men to repent and be saved. Well, if you're taking notes, you can write down 1 Timothy 2.4 and 1 Peter 3.9. That, that's where that idea comes from, is those two scriptures. Well, you can go John 3.16 if you want to. You know, that he died for the whole world, all right? But when you're looking at this story, when you're looking at Cain, look at the mercy and look at the faithfulness. God gives him an opportunity to resist sin. And then when he chooses not to, and to hide himself from God, and to go his own way and let his anger control him, when he allows sin to, to, have, to master him, instead of him mastering it, God still comes back to him. And he says, hey, where's your brother? And he gives him an opportunity to repent. And he doesn't repent. And he lets his anger and he lets his despondency control his response. And he never brings his repentance before God. And God still doesn't cast him out and still protects him and demonstrates mercy to him. All you see from God on behalf of Cain, yes, there are consequences to sin. Those consequences are designed to instruct us. They're designed to instruct us. They're designed to turn us back to him. It's like the kid reaching up on the stove and touching the burner. Hey, keep your hands away. Keep your hands away. Keep your hands away. Ouch! I told you. Not good for you. Because our best is God. And he understands that. And as a loving Heavenly Father who loves his children, he tries to warn us and he tries to teach us in the right way. He warns Cain. He gives Cain time to repent. He keeps Cain safe. And then we also see the faithfulness in God that though Cain was not the line of the seed, he allows Eve to give birth to Seth. And he maintains his plan and he keeps going with what he has planned. And that eternal plan to offer redemption through the seed and through the Messiah. It's faithfulness. It's love. And I need you to understand, if you're here today, and you've had these battles, or you're locked in these battles even now, and you will have these battles in the future, I need you to understand that God is faithful. That He is there. That the sacrifice is sufficient, yes, even for what you've done, no matter how bad it is, no matter how vile it was, or no matter how long it lasted. If you are here, and if you're hearing the sound of my voice, and if you're hearing the Word of God, then you have the opportunity to walk in the spirit of repentance and to bring the sacrifice and just to take your heart and to humble it and to bring it before God. Now, I'm going to invite the band, and I'm going to invite the guys who are going to serve communion. Why don't you all come on up for a second? And I want you to listen to this scripture. Most of you have heard this before. This is 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 30. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread... And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you will proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Just a couple things I want you to know about communion. Communion is for the believer, and if that's not you, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, just pass the plate, okay? If you claim to be a follower after Christ... But you're in sin, and you recognize that, and you're not in a place of humility before God, kind of in the place that Cain was in the story. Just let it pass. But no matter what condition you came into this place, if you're willing to humble your heart before God, no matter where you've come from, even before you walked into this room, then examine yourself, agree with God, take sides with Him against yourself, because the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient and receive the body, and receive the blood. It's just bread, and it's just juice, but it proclaims the death of Christ 
for the forgiveness of the sins of man. And that is available to you right now. Right now in this place. If you just bring the willing sacrifice, the broken and contrite heart before God. So guys, go ahead and pass it out. You can receive this. You can take it. And as you feel it's appropriate, eat and drink. And then we'll close the service together in worship.